place. As long as I'm president of the United States, Iran will never be allowed to have a nuclear weapon. Tensions between China and the United States have been increasing over trade, coronavirus, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and now the South China Sea. It takes a few to make war, but it takes a village and a nation to build peace. Hold your fire. A podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hi, I'm Rob Malley. Today, I'm glad to co-host this podcast with uh, Richard Atwood, who's Crisis Group's Chief of Policy. So Richard, thanks for joining me. Thanks so much for having me on. So today, the main topic we're going to be discussing is our events in in Nigeria, Africa's most populous country, which is undergoing some very severe stress with protests and uh, and violence uh, related to other issues across the country. We'll be joined by Nandi Obasi, who's Crisis Group uh, Special uh, Advisor on Nigeria, and Comfort Iro, who's uh, our Africa Program Director. Uh, so we'll come to that in, in, in just a few minutes, uh, Richard. So I should tell people that we are recording this at just before lunchtime in the US on Wednesday. I'm in Brussels, so it's the evening in Brussels, but we're recording this before the results from a number of uh, battleground states have come in. It's not clear yet who the next US president will be. I don't know, Rob, if you got much sleep last night. I don't know how, how you're Not feeling much. about things. <laughs> are there things, are there conclusions you can already draw about the vote, irrespective of who wins? Any reflections that you already could share? Yeah, so these will be quick reflections, as you said, reflections on a sleepless night, which I think is probably the fate of tens of millions of Americans and probably people. I was getting emails throughout the night from people in Europe and in Africa and elsewhere. But so I'll start, as you said, we don't know what the outcome is. I mean, there's some trends, but I think it would be premature to conclude that one or the other would win. As you know, and as our listeners know, we've written about this. We're facing the scenario that we feared was the most likely to lead to unrest, which is one in which President Trump, on the basis of early results, declares victory prematurely threatens to bring this to court, even though, as I say, the votes haven't been counted. And it actually looks in some ways that, that Joe Biden may ultimately prevail. And, you know, to have one, the president announcing that the only way he's going to lose is through fraud, mobilizing his electorate in that direction, that's dangerous. That's my first commentary, which is, you know, the worst is not yet guaranteed by any means, but this was these were the conditions that we feared. The second is, and again, no matter who wins, I think Anyone in America, particularly on the Democratic side, needs to go through a healthy dose of self-reflection about the state of the U.S. and what happened. You know, I woke up this morning, Richard, with this thought, that crisis group as an organization, as a, as a way of thinking about the world, is at its best when it puts itself in the shoes of others. People we wouldn't naturally understand, but we try to understand and look at the world through their perspective, even if we strongly disagree with them. And I think what happened in the U.S. was a failure of that exercise, where Again, Democrats and the media and a lot of the political class simply was not in a position to understand the Trump phenomenon, how people who felt that they hadn't been heard or listened to found their voice in Trump, gave him absolute loyalty and allegiance, and have felt marginalized and looked upon dismissively by so many in in the other parts of the country. And I think that is something that we need to, to think about. And then my third thought is, given this polarization, it's just something, again, that occurred to me. We've been focused on how... President Trump is the anomaly, the historic anomaly in in the American political system right now. Maybe the more remarkable anomaly was President Obama, because he's the last one who, in a way, managed to transcend this partisan divide that I was just talking about. And maybe upon reflection, in hindsight, his victory is the one that's really quite astonishing. In a way, I'd like to turn it around to you, Richard, because you are not American, even though you've lived in the U.S. for many years. But putting on that crisis group lens, how, how do you look at this country that where there's two parts that simply don't seem to talk at each other, look at each other, understand one another? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a great point. You know, I think you picked up on a couple of things that I, I found really striking. You know, first of all, that anyone who was hoping that this would be a sort of firm repudiation of President Trump is obviously going to be very disappointed with this. I mean, wh- whoever prevails, clearly a lot of people cast ballots in support of the president. More people voted for Trump than voted for Hillary Clinton uh, four years ago. I mean, he's well above 65 million votes. So certainly not the repudiation of President Trump that some people were hoping for and the Democrats were hoping for. I think, you know, when you talk about the sort of sense of grievance that some of his supporters feel, I think it's an important point. And what I find quite difficult to assess is of his, of the people that cast ballots for him, 
How many were doing it because, you know, they were prepared to hold their nose on some of the things that they don't like about him, the way the way he interacts in public, his sort of civil discourse. But they like the economy. The, the economy was was raging before before the virus. They were prepared to give him the benefit of, of the doubt that he would get things started again after the virus. They liked his tax cuts. Maybe they liked the many appointments on, on different levels of the of the judiciary, especially, of course, in the Supreme Court. And they were prepared to hold their nose on some of the other stuff. And how much of the vote was a vote for, you know, some of the identity politics and the divisive politics that President Trump thrives on? You know, that that I think is still a, you know, it, it'll only become clearer with more research afterwards. That's one thing that struck me. The th- second thing that struck me comes to the polarization that you talked about. And again, we work in many countries that are polarized along identity lines. In the UK, they did some surveys recently, which showed that on some of the main policy issues So the most contentious policy issues in the UK, so immigration and race, the Brexit vote, inequality, economic policy, climate, the actual breakdown on what people thought of those different policies didn't break down along party lines. You know, the coalition of what people thought was quite different to the way the parties were aligned. Whereas it seems in the US that the way you cast your ballot, you know, whether you're Republican or Democrat, defines how you feel about a a whole host of different issues. And you can sort of predict that if you vote Republican, you tend to think this. If you vote Democrat, you tend to think that, which, of course, is a type of polarization that's much more difficult to bridge. And again, whoever is the next president, I mean, if it's if it's President Trump, nothing in his past suggests he's going to be trying to bridge that gap. But if it is uh, Joe Biden, you know, how he's going to bridge this sort of really deep polarization that appears to have afflicted U.S. politics, I think is a, you know, it's a really big question. Yeah, it's a good question. I, and I don't want to really venture an answer because we haven't done that work. My gut tells me that in some ways what you say is, is, is correct. Although, you know, in the same elections, you find that some people who vote for Trump have views that would find themselves quite comfortably with a Democrat who was sort of on the populist left side. So the lines are not always straight. And I, but I think it's something in any event that's going to be an added complication, assuming Joe Biden wins. It's likely that he'll have a Senate that will be Republican. It's likely, as you say, that he'll have a citizenry that's going to be very sharply divided. How he moves in that context is really anyone's guess. And I know that we're going to spend time thinking about it. But but one other thought before we turn to Nigeria, which I I was curious about and how you look at it. You know, I've I've been worrying about what President Trump, if he were defeated, would do in the interregnum. You know, the U.S. has this strange system where there's about 70 plus days during which a lame duck President Trump still has full power to do whatever he wants uh, or any president, outgoing president can do. And I was wondering what, you know, what a President Trump might do during that period if he had lost that might be to serve his own personal interests or to complicate President-elect Biden's way forward. But now if we're going to have a prolonged period of chaos and distraction and internal contestation, what will it mean, not just for what the U.S. will do abroad, but how other actors are going to react? Are they going to try to take advantage of this distraction? And I say that at a time when there's a war you know, that's raging in Nagorno-Karabakh. We are entering a potential, if not actual war in Ethiopia, which I'd love to hear your, your thoughts about as well. And so I just wonder whether other countries are going to see this as an opportunity to do things because they know that the U.S. is in no position to react? You know, I think it's, it's, <laughs> it's a big question. It's, I think it's difficult to, to say, of course. You know, we may have a result, uh, you know, later today or, or tomorrow. There may be still be protracted disputes in the courts, but it may be sort of fairly clear which way it's going to go. I think it, this comes in a context where already much of the global north you know, has been very distracted with with a pandemic that's, you know, since February, March this year has really kept them focused on on managing that crisis. I think drawing a direct line between that and some of the conflicts that, you know, you mentioned, the Karabakh, for example, uh, what's happening now in, in Ethiopia, drawing a direct line between the pandemic and some of those conflicts, you know, I think is probably misleading. In some cases, maybe they were, con- maybe it was a contributive factor. Certainly we've seen uh, leaders in some parts of the world consolidate their grip on power, take advantage of the distraction to crack down on rivals, to close political space. We've seen this in some parts of the world, you know, and perhaps that sort of thing, if there is a protracted crisis in the US, you know, may may continue. And I think it's, you know, this comes a little bit to an assessment of how you view President Trump's foreign policy tenure, which is a much bigger question. You know, and some people argue that, that the U.S. has been has sort of been absent in parts of the world for a couple of years or at least or, or, or three or four years. And in, in some parts of the world, it's been very present. So I think it's a, it's difficult to, to, to predict. Sure, it's, it's feasible that the U.S. engulfed in a sort of major political crisis 
But, you know, it's, it's far from clear that's going to happen. If it did happen, sure, it's plausible that people take advantage of that. But already Western leaders have been consumed by the pandemic for some months. So, Rich, I think you're right. I don't want to, let's not draw a straight line, but we mentioned Ethiopia. And uh, I want to come to that because we're about to talk about protests and unrest in Africa's most populous country, in Nigeria. We now have an actual war, an internal war in Africa's second most populous country, Ethiopia. So could you tell us a little bit about what's behind it and where it may be headed? Yeah, I think the crisis in Ethiopia is a, this is a really big story and it, it threatens to get swallowed up in the, the news about the US election. You know, it would be difficult to overstate the significance of Ethiopia in, in East Africa and the Horn of Africa, themselves extremely you know, important geostrategic regions. Ethiopia, what a population of 110 million, pivotal country in East Africa, really important for the stability of the region. And there's been this, this dispute brewing that we've covered in depth between Ethiopian Prime Minister Avi Ahmed and the leaders of the Tigray region. And really, since Abiy has come to power, I think Tigray leaders feel that they've been the biggest losers. Uh, the Tigrayans held power, dominated Ethiop Ethiopian politics for many years before Abiy took over. And they really feel aggrieved, I think, at, at how much they've lost since he's come to power. So the dispute has been brewing for some time, but it's really taken a nasty turn over, over recent months. Prime Minister Abiy and his government decided, I think understandably, to push back elections because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Tigrayan leaders uh, disagreed. They pushed ahead with their own regional elections. Addis Ababa rejected those elections, rejected the legitimacy of the new government and has, had threatened then to withhold federal funding, federal subsidies for Tigray. The rhetoric sort of really got heated over the last, last couple of weeks with, I think, Parliament declaring that the Tigray party should be declared a terrorist organization. And then I think we're recording on Wednesday, I think yesterday, Prime Minister Abiy claims that there was a, a, an attack by Tigrayan paramilitaries or Tigrayan forces. I mean, the Tigray region has a, a big security forces of its own, an attack by them on, a, on an Ethiopian base. He's essentially said that this amounts to, to a declaration of war. And reportedly now there's fighting between federal forces, between the Ethiopian army, on the outskirts of the Tigray capital, Mekele. There's a danger that President Isaiah Safwerki, the Eritrean president, gets drawn in. There's a lot of bad blood between Isaias and the uh, Tigray leaders based on the sort of long-standing conflict that Abiy struck a peace deal with, with Isaias to end. So I think it's, it's really, you know, arguably, notwithstanding the U.S. election, this is big, big news. And I think it's this pivotal country is really, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say it's teetering on the border of a really, really dangerous escalation. Yeah, as you say, I mean, it's, it's something that we all focus on the U.S. election, but the most dangerous development may be taking place uh, in Ethiopia. Now uh, we're going to turn to Nigeria uh, with our two guests, Namde Obasi and, and Comfort Eero. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. So, Richard, now it's uh, on to the, the main item on our menu today, which is talking about a key country in Africa, Nigeria, which has been racked by protests and has a history of violent conflict that Crisis Group has covered for years. And delighted to be joined by, by, by two uh, Crisis Group colleagues. First, Nandi Obasi, who's our senior advisor on Nigeria, who's in Abuja. Nandi, hello. Hello. Thank you. Good to have you. And uh, Comfort Iro, who's our Africa program director. She's been with us since 2011. She's in Nairobi. Comfort, great to have you. Thank you very much. So I thought I'd start with Nandia. For those who are listening to us who may not know why Nigeria plays such an important role demographically, politically, in every way on the, on the continent, just give us a, a sense of the weight of, of Nigeria on the African continent and in the world. Yes, like you said already, it's the biggest country demographically in Africa. It's about a quarter of the African population, 200 million people. And it's, well, fluctuates between the largest and the second largest economy on the continent. It's uh, South Africa. It's also a major player in the politics of Africa, in the African Union and the, in the economic community of West African states. It's played very active roles in regional diplomacy as well as in peacekeeping operations. So I guess it's fair to say, as has been said about other countries and other circumstances, that when Nigeria sneezes, Africa catches a cold, and it has been sneezing of late. I mean, there's been this vast protest movement, which has captured headlines. Tell us a little bit more about what was behind them, what they were about, and, and what they've meant for, for Nigeria. Well, the protests were basically about a unit of the police 
called the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, and abbreviated SARS. It's been in existence since the 1990s, but over time, it's uh, been performing very poorly. Its personnel have been accused of numerous, numerous human rights abuses, cases of corruption and extortion from people, torture in detention centers, extrajudicial killings, and so on. And since 2017, there was already a movement that was building up that was called the End SARS Movement. But more recently, at the beginning of October, some incidents happened that tended to outrage the public a lot more. And that galvanized a, a wider movement calling for the disbandment of the police unit. And so the protest started basically against that police unit, but then expanded to demanding wider police reform. And it's also then for some of the protesters provided an, a platform for demanding improvements in governance because the, the failures of the police were also seen as a symptom of the wider failures in, in governance. And so we, we got into the protests in the first week of October. Uh, initially, the government responded favorably. It, it disbanded the police units, it said so. And then the, it also accepted the five other demands of the protesters but that didn't seem to go far enough. And the protests then went on until the police started to crack down on the protesters. And some elements also organized an anti-protest movement that then took out violence on the protesters and the situation got worse. But by the time the protests were actually uh, dying down because of where the leaders of the movement thought the street protests could no longer be contained, it then snowballed into a wider violence that is not exactly connected to the policing issues, but just people taking laws into their hands. And then we had a huge outblow of um, lawlessness and looting and arson in several cities across the country. But at the moment, all that has died down you know, substantially. Um, there are no street protests. There are no cases of, of um, lawlessness of, of recent. Lots of arrests have been made. Part of the, the response was to set up in states judicial panels of inquiry that are supposed to address you know, past uh, abuse and try to compensate victims and probably also sanction offenders. But that process is only just starting and we don't know how well it will go. Thanks, Namdi. Could, could we come back to the policies in a moment and, and just talk, talk again a little bit more about the protests themselves? Could you say something about who the protesters were, what sort of people? Am I right that they were mostly young? Uh, was it a movement with a protest movement with leaders? Uh, how organized was it? Did the protest take place mostly in urban areas across the country? Was there a geographic element to it? Did the movement draw at all on uh, similar protest movements in, in other countries? The movement was heavily dominated by young people. And part of the reason why it's that way was also that the universities across the country have been shot since February because of a, a labor dispute between the government and the academic staff union of universities. So the thousands and hundreds of thousands of students who should have been in school have been home since February. And that is part of you know, the discontent and they were available to join the protests, but it's largely a youth protest. Geographically, it's been more concentrated in the South than in the North. Uh, also because the, 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 the police has tended to be more abusive in the large cities in the South, uh, Port Harcourt, Lagos, Wari, and elsewhere than they have been in the North. And the, the North also has its own different security issues that it's dealing with. The Boko Haram in the Northeast, the banditry and other criminal violence in the Northwest. And so there's not as much enthusiasm in the North as there is in the South about banning you know, the SARS unit. As a matter of fact, most people in the North felt the SARS should be more empowered to deal with the security issues that they are dealing with. So we didn't have as much involvement from the North as we had in the South. Could you also just, just say a word about how Nigerians that didn't take to the streets, uh, those that didn't join the protests, how do they view the protesters? Are they sympathetic to what they're calling for? Is the anger about police brutality, about uh, the SARS and, and the security forces more broadly, how they've been behaving, is that, is that anger widespread? And how do people feel then about the looting and disorder that's followed the protests? Well, first of all, in the South, there's a lot of support for the movement, as I said earlier on, because the abuses were more, more pronounced in the South. So there's a lot of support for the movement. There's a lot of sympathy for the, the movement, not as much in, in the North. Um, but then at some point, people also started to feel that the government had responded somewhat 
and there was a need to go up the streets, especially when it started turning, I mean, degenerating to violence. About the later violence that became a lot more uh, widespread, people are rather ambiguous about it. On the one hand, they're, they're, they're opposed to lawlessness, but on the other hand, some of the violence was also directed at warehouses where food, pharmaceuticals, and so on, that were intended to uh, as relief packages for the COVID-19 lockdowns had been kept for several months. And people just couldn't understand why governments and public officials would stock up all of these while there's so much hunger you know, in, in the country. And so in a subtle way, some people were in support of, of the breaking of the warehouses and so on. But generally also, there's a lot of concern that this you know, got out of hand, especially when the police also became a target. On the whole, about 22 policemen were killed in the violence, and about 25 police stations were completely destroyed, burnt down, vandalized, and guns were taken away. Jail houses were broken into at least 2,000 people, a little over 2,000 inmates fled. And so this tends to add to insecurity. Guns have been taken away in unaccountable hands. Uh, criminals who were under trial have been set free, and even courts have been vandalized and records of uh, prosecutions are no longer available. So there is a real concern that this got out of hand and it's not a very healthy development. At the moment, the police had withdrawn from the streets and from garden places. And they, they are very reluctant to redeploy because the, the fear that if they deploy in small, small numbers, they could be overwhelmed and lynched by, by mobs. And, so we're largely in an unpoliced uh, condition. Even at the best of times, when we had police everywhere, the numbers were too small, the resources were too small, they were not providing sufficient protection. But right now, they're all withdrawn to their stations and their barracks, and that creates a more difficult security situation. I just want to pick up on what Namdi said in relation to the, to the police, because when we look at sort of what needs to be done going forward, it's not just about responding to the youth demands, but it's also about dealing with a sad reality of Nigeria, which is we have a very demoralized police who have taken a beating, not just in relation to this crisis, but also in the Northeast. You'll remember that a lot of the police forces, the barracks um, were targeted during the Boko Haram insurgency. And now, again, we're seeing the, the, the police underpaid, demoralized, targeted, not just in Lagos, but right across other states um, that we saw of violence in Delta and right across the, the, the South, South, the Southwest and the Southeast. Rob, you'll remember when you traveled with us to um, Lagos, particularly, uh, picking up what, on what Namdi was saying, the sporadic um, attack against key government installations, against um, the High Court that you saw, the High Court of Appeal, against um, significant properties belonging to key politicians, shows you the frustration against the political class of Nigeria. Um, so the, these are indications that there is some deep undercurrents here that go way beyond just the police, but also the political class of Nigeria. This is Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Today, we're talking with Comfort Iro and Namdi Obasi. If you look back at the several years, back to 2011 and now, and the wave of protests against governments that are viewed as, uh, you know, either too corrupt or too repressive or unrepresentative, and in general, these movements, and many have failed, begin on one specific, specific issue and then become a, a movement that can only be satisfied when the whole and when the entire political class is replaced, when the regime falls. I mean, we've seen that even recently. We've seen it in Lebanon, we've seen it in Algeria, we saw it in, in Sudan. How much of that could happen in Nigeria, where a protest moving over, SARS over the, the police unit, becomes a demand for something much bigger, which is in some ways both more exhilarating for the people who are protesting, but much harder to achieve? Are we seeing echoes of that comfort based on what you just said, Nandi, on, on, on what you're seeing? Yes, I mean, I think one thing that we should point out, Rob, we're talking in the year that Nigeria celebrates its 60th anniversary from independence. And a number of, you know, a number of people of all generations of Nigeria will raise to you the fundamental concerns about governance, about corruption, about a bankrupt society, about how Nigeria is broken at various la layers, whether it's federal, whether it's state, whether it's the local authorities as well. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in Nigeria to deal with mounting problems. I mean, 
it's not lost on any of us that there have been 30 years, successive years of protests against the police. There have been 30 years of protest against corruption, um, against um, gender-based violence. You'll notice that those involved also um, in the protest were feminist coalitions as well, to go back to what Namdi says about you know, a, a cross-section of society that were involved. So for me, this is an important opportunity now to begin to look at those key issues of reform. And you would have noticed also in all our reports, um, Rob, we always list a litany of commitments that the government makes um, on a number of fronts. And the, the key challenge, not just for this government, but successive and future, is to begin to implement some very, very clear um, reforms that talk to all these issues. We can list to you numerous reform agendas that have been put forward on the, on the police. Will the government act? It says it will. We have to hold them to, to, to account on, on, on that very issue. Yes, just to add to the point that Comfort made, it's not just about the Buhari administration. It's about a failure of governance at all levels, the federal level, the state level, and even the local level. And this has bred a very deep sense of discontent. Added to that is the corruption of the political elite and the wide income disparities and the growing poverty and the rising unemployment. And this has been aggravated also by the COVID-19 situation that has added to, I mean, diminished the country's revenue earnings from oil largely. But then also the, the insecurity in the North has disrupted agriculture. And the combination of all of these has led to increasing inflation. We're having last month the highest inflation rate in 30 months. And so it's a combination of unemployment, inflation, bad governance, deepening poverty, and apparent aloofness of the political class, and they're not mm -hmm. just failure to engage with the issues mm -hmm. and the continuous the, the, the trust deficits between the government mm -hmm. and the people. And all of this came together and imploded in this protest. So the protests that have racked, you know, as you said, many parts of the country over the last few weeks, these come on top of, uh, of a lot of other challenges that Nigeria is facing. There's the Boko Haram insurgency in the Northeast, now, Boko Haram as a movement is far diminished to what it was in 2014, 2015. The movement splintered, um, but still poses an enormous challenge around Lake Chad in, in Nigeria's northeast. There's the herder farmer violence, which, Namdi, you've written about a lot and has actually been even deadlier than the Boko Haram insurgency uh, over the last couple of years. Started in the Middle Belt, spreading. You have this banditry insecurity in the northwest, uh, vigilantism in other parts of the country. So these protests come on top of a lot of other challenges that Nigeria and President Buhari are, are dealing with. So when you put all this together, how do you see the, the remainder of Buhari's term? How do you see his top priorities? Well, first of all, the protesters think the government hasn't shown empathy for the issues that they have raised. And the Lekki shooting, for instance, the government didn't react in time. And even up to this point, there's still a lot of denial about you know, who did what and who gave what orders and so on and so forth. So the first thing the government needs to do about this is to make sure the panels of inquiry that set up by the states actually do work and give victims a sense of redress and justice and also bring the, the perpetrators, the abusers uh, to book. And then it needs to step forward about police reform. Like Comfort said, we've been through this again and again and again. Promises have been made, panels have been set up they do studies and they submit reports, but there, there is a great deal of inertia. There's little that is done in terms of acting on those reports. I think this is an opportunity to actually act on those reports and show that something is being done in terms of police reform. But there's also the need to address the wider issues, the unemployment, the need for students to go back to school. It's just not acceptable that for 10 months, university students all over the country are at home. And there is not a sense of urgency about resolving the issues between the academic staff union and the government in order for the students to go back to school. So there's a need for the government to step up in various areas. Too many things have piled up over time. And all of this has gotten almost to a breaking point. You know, in a sense, Richard, the genie is out of the bottle now. This has been mountain, mountain, mountain. And it's not just about even the judicial panels. It's not just about reform. Beyond these issues, there's a deeper challenge that I, I think that will also make the next few years, the remaining years of Bahari's government, very difficult if he's not seen 
to, to deal with the crisis that is unfolding in Nigeria. The population of Nigeria, not just in Nigeria itself, but across many um, countries, across many continents, are deeply upset in, which, in, in the manner in which the government used its traditional tool of bringing out the security sector against its population. So the people are, are, are pained, not just in, in Nigeria, but across in the diaspora. People are also shell-shocked. The death toll has upset so many people. And it's not just ordinary people who have died, as I said, it's the police too. So beyond the reforms, you, you know, you need Bihari to be, you know, to be the comforter in chief, to go out to the population, you know, and to see, see the nation. Um, people are suspicious of Abuja. People are, are concerned that, that the presidency remains a, a, aloof. So they've got to go out there, visit families of the bereaved, visit those who have lost families, visit those who really are deeply shocked uh, about what's happened. You know, and when you listen to a number of people in Nigeria's civil society, they tell you that, you know, that, that people are really, really, really embittered and upset. And this is way beyond reforms and way beyond judicial pan panels. Well, it does uh, both what you have all said shows sort of the magnitude of the challenge. And as you said, a piling up of grievances, maybe too much for Nigeria on its own to, to, to carry. Is there something that Nigeria's African or international partners could do to help? Or is this really something that Nigeria is going to have to tackle on its own comfort since you, you, you travel uh, across Africa and, and, and the world? What's, what is your sense of what outsiders can or cannot do? Well, I mean, first, let's also just put on the table that there have been in the past numerous support for reforms, whether it's in Nigeria's um, security sector or to deal with corruption writ large. And also, we should acknowledge that SARS, you know, was part of, for example, the UK government's own sort of conflict stability and, and, and security sector police program. And so th there have been various attempts um, to strengthen capacity, capability to do with the corruption and to improve community policing as well. So those need to continue. But the question is, why haven't they necessarily changed or altered the dynamics within the security sector? And it goes back to what Namdi said about basic things around underspend and you know inability uh, within the police. I mean, Rob, an average police, a young recruit gets $24 a month. This is in a country where the senator gets around about 76,000 a month. They pay themselves well. The legislators who are supposed to help reform and clean up the act of the country are the ones who do well out of, the, out, out of this as well. So it's, there is an external role that's important, but there's a lot that Nigeria needs to do itself at, at home. Beyond these issues, I think we need to think differently about international support. And I know that parts of the, the government are thinking about job creation. And here, you know, internationals can help with some long term creative thinking about private get credit. And while it's hard to do business in Nigeria, there are some innovative sectors and where the international community can help because job creation is a reality, as Namdi was talking about as well. Just to add to what um, Comfort said, I think we need to be clear that the, the Nigerians must bear primary responsibility for the country and any reforms have to be basically internally driven on benefiting from international support, but it has to be internally driven. So one area I think the international community can support is engaging with the civil society and other organizations that are actually pushing for change and pushing for reform, whether we talk about police reform or uh, corruption or accountability in governance and so on, there's a role for civil society in Nigeria to play and it could benefit more from international support. There's also the need for the international partners to help the Nigerian police and the Nigerian government in various areas. Like Comfort said, it's not just about security sector reform, it's also about rule of law, the entire rule of law chain, judicial reform, penal reform, and so on and so forth. Improving the capacity of anti-corruption agencies I think these are all various areas where the international community can support. But there's a huge, huge need for reform of the police. As Comfort said, the numbers are too small. They need to be expanded. The resourcing of the police is very, very miserable. That needs to be greatly improved. The training, the recruitment standards, the equipment, the orientation of the police to be a protector rather than a predator 
issues about human rights and accountability and partnership with the co community and citizens, all of this needs to be completely reworked, completely overhauled. As Nigerians, if I could ask you, what's your greatest fear? What's your greatest hope uh, when it comes to, to your country? The, the greatest fear is that things could get a lot worse than they are at the moment. We have a huge structural load, largest number of children out of school in the world, largest number of people living in extreme poverty in the world, a high population growth rate. And all of this is not going to be stopped instantly. Whatever we do now, it's going to take quite some time to bring down population growth. It's going to take some time to improve school enrollment. It's going to take time to alleviate poverty. And if there's not a very vigorous change in the trajectory of governance, this is all going to get worse. On the other hand, while the problems are mounting, it does seem that the capacity to deal with them institutionally is also getting weaker. The police is in a much weaker state than it is now. The quality of governance across the board, not only at federal level, but at state and local government levels, is also worse than it was in the past. So when you have problems mounting and the capacity to deal with those problems diminishing, then that's really a source for great concern. And your hope? No, I, I, think, I think there's hope with the younger people. There is a lot of energy. Um, and lots of them are actually stepping up and leveraging on the opportunities created by the internet and modern technologies and so on. So it's not a totally hopeless situation. All of this just needs an improvement in leadership, an improvement in investment in human capital development and cleaner governance. I think Nigeria still has quite some potential. I think what worries me um, is that, you know, it's clear that the government hasn't learned all the lessons that they ought to have learned, you know, especially in responding um, to the needs of the young people. The country may be old and the country may still be, be run um, by, old, by an older generation, but the country's profile is younger. And that's, in some, that's something important for us to keep an eye on. What makes me hopeful and sort of my own sort of big, big takeaway and something that we shouldn't sort of lose sight of is that for the protesters, for the young people who have been um, out there, there, there seems to be a renewal of civil society to engage more robustly, I think, with, with important national and um, political protests and to challenge the, the political leaders. And, you know, Rob, the last weekend of, of October into November, you know, we saw a, a very interesting sort of coming together of Nigeria's sort of youthful diaspora across several borders. So, you know, there was a Zoom call led by a group called We Move. Um, if you just go onto Twitter and just do a hashtag called We Move Niger or hashtag We Move to 2020. And that focused discussions um, on the way forward. These were young people, you know, arguing about the, the way forward. And it was, you know, incredible youthful online moment. They described themselves as a citizens collective, and they drew together within the space of seven, seven days, 3,000 people on Zoom, 5,000 plus on YouTube and others on television. In London, you know, in London, in the US and, and in Nigeria, in South Africa and Kenya, it was, it was phenomenal. And that's what keeps me hopeful, that the young are now, like their parents, defining what kind of future. And this time, um, they're able to do it publicly using various platforms. And Interestingly enough, they've been backed also by a number of online platforms as well to, to, to continue. So this is, this is a hopeful moment as well, despite the tragedy of, of what we saw in the last two weeks. Well, Comfort, Namdi, thank you so much. Thank you for reminding me how grateful I am to have you as colleagues. And I'm sure we'll be calling on you a lot in the coming months. So thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hold your fire. A podcast by the International Crisis Group. So before closing, Rob, do you want to say what, what Crisis Group has got coming out this week? What should people be looking at? Yeah. So uh, first of all, our flagship monthly uh, output, which is Crisis Watch, which looks at and tracks conflicts around the globe, something that people really should look at if they want to know what's happening, even in places they might not be paying attention to. A briefing on the ceasefire in Libya, a fragile one, but a very welcome one as well. And then we were just talking earlier about Ethiopia, for those who want to understand in more detail what's happening, we have a briefing that explains the conflict between Tigray and Addis Abeba and a statement calling for an immediate cessation of hostilities. So those are the things that you could look at and read um, in your spare time. That's it for this week. Thanks, Richard. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on.
Great having you. And uh, if you have any questions, please send them to media at crisisgroup.org. You could leave a rating or review on iTunes or Apple Podcast. And again, want to thank the great Crisis Group team that puts this podcast together every week. Have a good week, everyone, and talk to you next week. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.